Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT Show. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. And let me tell you in advance, you're going to love this tonight. Thanks for joining us on India Live. This is our 145th TNT Show. And thanks to you, India Live continues, uh, as it has been for the last 13 years, to add more new shows. But the channel, as always, needs your support. So please do what you can. Uh, we try our best. Our viewing figures uh, are comparable sometimes with the BBC, uh, or some shows on the BBC, but we don't have anything remotely like their enormous budget. So if you believe that uh, you want to become the media, then this is the place uh, to look at and see what folks are doing. So rather than say, oh, I don't like the media, or the media distresses me, there's something you can do. And one of these things is to follow this show and some of the others that we'll talk about tonight. You know, it's been another great day for British democracy. We, we learned this week that the oil uh, in the Scottish uh, area of the North Sea is like Schrodinger's cat. You may remember that Schrodinger had this theorem or notion that a cat could be in two places at the same time. It could be inside a box and simultaneously, same time, it may be outside the box. It's, it's based on quantum theory, and it's not something I'm prepared to get into tonight. <laughs> not, not being Schrodinger. Uh, so, the cat can be inside the box or outside the box at the same time, and Scotland's oil is a bit like that. If it belongs to an independent Scotland, uh, then it's just not enough to keep that new country afloat. At the same time, we are assured that it is enough to keep the entire UK prosperous. What about that? Eh? It can be inside the box or outside the box at the same time. Tonight we are talking to the two Davies. David McGuinness, who you may recall if you watched his show, is a truck driver and observer of Scottish and UK-wide politics and previously broadcast a daily news show uh, from his truck car. And David Milligan is a sound engineer and business owner. The two Davies now have a popular twice weekly show on YouTube. And they're here tonight uh, to talk about what they do and to answer your questions. Now, there's something else that doesn't happen on the BBC. When were you ever allowed to ask a question on the BBC? It never happens, but it happens every single week on this show. So we'll be taking your questions live. And remember, you know, I keep repeating this, I'm sorry, it's a fact. The TNT show is free, as well as being live. So no license, no problem. So the questions will be posted on the screen. And now to our special guests. Hello, Davy and David. Thanks for joining us. How are you? How are you doing? Hi, great, John. Nice to be in your show. Yeah, it's good uh, to be here. It, it's, we're delighted that you can join us tonight. It's going to be a cracking show because you guys have already got a cracking show. So we're simply building upon what you've achieved. Let's start off with you, David. Uh, what prompted you to put together your show? Well, which one, John? Oh, it's David. me. <laughs> David, I'll, call, I'll call you David, and if I may, yeah. I'll call David Davy. That's it. That's the way. Yeah, that's the way. Screen, David and Davy. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, 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 the impetus for it was that things were breaking down badly on Facebook. We had Facebook uh, were trying to block a lot of stuff that was going on. We saw the, the David's broadcast was being fiddled with at times. And uh, we, we started to look at different ways that we could actually get his broadcast onto the web. And okay. we thought, YouTube, we'll try. And actual fact, the first thing we, we tried was Zoom because everybody was using Zoom for, for uh, video conferencing. So we tried that, and uh, we went on to YouTube, started a YouTube channel, and that was very, very good. David discovered the, the Restream platform, which allows us to put onto both Facebook and also onto YouTube without any, any real cost to us. So that was the reason for um, putting it together in that way. It seems to have... Growing arms and legs, let's say. And what I'm particularly proud of is the fact that we, we have people donating money. You know, in this 
an age of 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 the people being poor and all the rest of it and the cost of living for all and all the rest of it. We've got people that, that actually donate. God bless the wee souls, seriously. And they're donating for uh, food banks. And okay. David and I have set up a, a, an account where people can donate to it. And we get the really, really lovely task of choosing food banks to give a few hundred quid to, that sort of thing, you know. And okay. it's wonderful. It really is wonderful. Anyway. I'll leave you there with that, John. Well, uh, I think it's his turn now. <laughs> Off you go, David. Well, I started down for the end of the talk. Uh, um, well, let's give you a timeline, John. David and I started it together with Facebook online to campaign back in 2011, 2012. Um, a 2011 to get the SNP, the majority, that led to the announcement in 2012 to the referendum in 2014. And uh, David set up a couple of the earliest independence uh, Facebook groups, and I was yeah. commenting on them, and he liked the comments that I was making. So what he said to me was, David, what you're saying is true, but you're not putting up links. And I said, what do you mean I'm not putting up links? I said, this has got nothing to do with what other people are saying. This is my own research. He says, now that's not good enough. People only believe links. You have to go and find links. So I set up in a couple of years of research into different areas, and he feeding in links with different colleges and different universities and things like the things I was saying. But silly to me because most of it was quite common sense. You know, absolutely silly to me. But it sent us down a wee route of trying to find credibility. And then we go to the 2014 referendum and it was a no. It was like Frankenstein. It was like Frankenstein building his monster. This one, right? Uh, uh, purely and simply. Got him to, to think about that. He was asking me a question. I'm going, think about it, research it, and come back to me. And he kept on doing it and kept on doing it until eventually he was better than me. Yeah, bugger. Anyway. <laughs> hey, then we go to 2015 and, and with the general election. So Dave and I set up a group called Spot to Spot. And we set up constituency groups. And we got to some like 125 to 150,000 members across the, the whole of Scotland and the constituency mm -hmm. groups. And we were all campaigning hard to get that 56 MPs in Westminster. The disappointing thing about it was they didn't go in a manifesto of the majority of MPs were going to walk. Because at 56 out of 59, there's no argument there, none. Yeah. You know, so, um, but Dave and I have now been campaigning online for. 2011, I think we started. Yeah, that's right. 2023. Now, but the broadcasting thing, I got a wee artist in the end, uh, an artist in the independence movement. I was putting out the odd video when something was stupid in the news or something was tragic in the news, yeah. especially with the 10, uh, seven, eight years ago, as we say, we seen the UK government's oppress, oppression of the, the, the disabled, taking away their cars, cutting their benefits restricting them to their houses, the introduction of the bedroom tax, all that sort of thing. Um, yeah. I was putting out the occasional broadcast to writing these things. And an artist friend of mine, a wee guy called uh, Michael Larkin, better known in the independence movement as we scribbles, said to me, David, you should do this every day. Yeah. So I started putting out daily broadcasts where I would spend seven or eight hours researching what was being put out in the mainstream media and then do a 45 minute news, news broadcast from my truck when I was on my break. But in the long term, that was um, bad for my health because John, you've worked in professional media, so you know how long it takes to put a short segment together. Yeah. It can take hours and hours of research and then compress that into a five minute um, segment. Yeah. So in the end, our, our six years are done you know, a, a live broadcast and about four years of live broadcasting every day, it started to take about a toll on my health because I was working 12 hours a day as a truck driver and yeah. then seven or eight hours a day as a research and then another couple of hours in the morning before I went back out in the truck so I'm doing two hours sleep to write the bloody show. <laughs> so, um, and you haven't been in broadcasting and will know that that's basically how it works. You've got a team of people already researching what's behind the, the headlines well, and then you try and give a balanced view. 
Yeah, or, or you could do it the way BBC Scotland do it, which is to say uh, the editor tells them in the morning, this is what you're going to say. You don't have to do any research. Uh, here's a couple of friendly individuals, uh, and we've got to make sure we've, we know in advance what they're going to say because they've been on every week for the last six weeks. Uh, and there's Joe blogs for uh, ferries. Uh, there's Bill blogs for uh, care homes. Uh, and there's somebody else. Uh, but anyway, at the end, of the end of the day, they don't need to know anything. The interviewer doesn't need to know anything. They've got a couple of three lines that they tackle, and it's that's it, wrapped up in a nutshell. First of all, I need to make an apology. And my apology is to... Uh, <laughs> I need to find you first. Uh, it's to it's about Schrodinger's cat. Uh, and it's an apology to Daniel Blair. And you're right, Daniel. Schrodinger's theorem does, does not say the cat is either inside the box or outside the box. That is an incidental. What it also what it actually says is the cat is either alive or dead at the same time. <laughs> but, it, a, but, it still, but it still applies to the oil industry in Scotland. Is it alive or is it dead? Yeah, According yeah, to yeah. the run up to the 2014 referendum, it was dead. According to Rishi Sunak, it all it is very much alive. Yeah, but even on the basis of what he said, it's not logical because they have to still have to buy a lot of oil on the, on the open market. It's that, that oil is completely owned by the, the the group that actually extracts it. So whether it be BP or Shell, uh, and but incidentally, uh, in a happy coincidence, it turns out that one of uh, Sunak's uh, family uh, controlled or uh, invested firms. It is actually has a big new contract with BP. So if BP have chosen uh, as the uh, extracting uh, company, then presumably uh, that com his company will benefit, uh, mm -hmm. which is, seems to me to be rather odd uh, in the circumstances where I thought you had to be, uh, in terms of integrity, and I remember he stood on the steps of 10 Downing Street and told us that his administration would have integrity. Seems to me if you actually believed in integrity, you wouldn't even risk the possibility that you might be seen to be acting unethically, that clearly I'm wrong uh, as are the rest of us, because apparently you can do exactly as you please once you become Prime Minister, which is very sad. I, I wanted to move on, if I may. John, John that, comes, that comes down to the shareholding that each MP has, right? Um, you know, if you, if you imagine, let's say you became a, an MP tomorrow, right? Yeah. You walk into the house of Tom, they ask you, they ask you to uh, divulge all your business stuff and all the rest of it, right? But you only have to divulge uh, 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 shareholding above 15% of a company. Now, if you 15% of a shareholder of a tiny wee company like mine, that's quite a lot, right? Or, or to me, that's quite a lot. However, 15% shareholding of BP or Shell, you would be utterly, you'd be minted. You would actually be dripping gold, John, right? And so, therefore, these MPs can have up to 15% shareholding in particular companies. They don't have to say a dicky bird. Well, that, that was my broader point. Not so much that they met the criteria, but rather to say that even the semblance of the appearance of it is wrong. If you believe in integrity, if you don't believe in integrity, then, of course, you will then quote that figure of 15%. You will say, look, I complied. But it seems to be integrity is not about compliance, or at least that ma majorly it's not about compliance. It's about whether you behave ethically or not and are happy to tell everyone how much your shareholding is and how much it's worth. And that's the difference between uh, compliance and uh, are sticking to a rule or behaving with integrity. We can all stick to the rules. I mean, after all, the rest of us can drive under 30 and 30 mile limit, but that doesn't make us terribly ethical. That's where parliamentary privilege is um, a problem, because as long as they're in that parliament, they're basically above the law, because they're the legislators. Well, they're, 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 they're above the law because of the sovereignty of Westminster. And what that means, if it means anything, it means that if, if you're the largest party, uh, effectively you, you can rewrite the constitution on a daily basis, if not an hourly basis. So you can actually uh, back legislation that clears you of any 
mis, uh, misdemeanor of any kind, whether it be. Well, I appreciate that, John, because uh, if, if we look at the COVID legislation that was put in place in England and the COVID legislation that was put in place in Scotland, both uh, governments absolved themselves of responsibility for the outcomes of the pandemic. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I can understand that because how, how, I mean, how do you establish what the outcome of a pandemic is? I mean, you, you can you can look at it from the point of view that there's a bunch of people who are no longer with us, and that's a fact. Uh, but then if you try and trace it back from there and say, well, these people likely to have survived whether the COVID was around or not, then it gets more complicated. Uh, and of course, you can do what the UK government is doing. You can refuse to turn up altogether to any such inquiry and, and absolve yourself that way. Uh, I think as long as you have a situation where one group of people can actually set the rules uh, with, without consultation with others, because that's the way the UK is run just now, then effectively you, you've actually set up a corrupt system. I mean, for example, if you, if you had the same system operating in Malaysia and elsewhere, you would say, look at that, there's a third world country behaving like bandits, effectively. Uh, and that's the way the UK is run. It's, it's run on the same basis, that, that one group of people can decide on their own what the law is going to be. And that, you, it's hard to argue the justice of that, it seems to me. But let's move us on. It, can we talk about the by-election that's coming up? What are your thoughts on that, Davy? Yeah, OK. okay. Um, I was a bit surprised, John, that he, I actually met the threshold to trigger a by-election. But now that it has triggered the by-election, um, this is going to be a test of resolve of the Scottish people. Um, do we put the SNP back in under whom the use of uh, leadership who says he's going to hold a plebiscite election or a, a democratic event at the next Westminster election, which is going to bring about Scottish independence? Or um, do the people of uh, Hamilton and Rutherford um, uh, West sorry, East, um, a, did they decide that um, they're going to put Labour back in because Labour probably won the majority in the next election? Yeah. And they, will they vote Tory twice? Because that's what the Labour Party are now under Keir Starmer. I don't see much point of the Labour Party under Keir Starmer, actually. I, I, think, I think the test isn't what you and I and David think and the folks in the audience tonight think. It's what 50 people, predominantly in the south of England, think. Because under the first-past-the-post system, that's essentially how the UK operates. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we could vote any which way we like, but it won't determine the outcome. I mean, even if every single person in Scotland voted SNP uh, or Labour, it, it wouldn't influence the final outcome, which would be determined by uh, these 50-odd seats, uh, predominantly in the south of England. That, 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 because of first-past-the-post, Almost every other seat is spoken for. And so when Keir Stammer bangs on about we're not going to uh, help uh, poor children, the two child cap and all that, he, he's not appealing to you and I or anyone else in Scotland or in Ireland, Northern Ireland or in Wales. He's simply addressing the people in those 50 constituencies because that's all that matters to him. And, and he can come to Scotland and say something else, and I'm sure he will during the by election. And sure, some of his. Uh, his the Labour people in Scotland will, will echo that line, but the fact of it is, he doesn't care because he, he doesn't need to care. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's 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 the way the system is, is set up, I'm afraid. John, I, I feel I actually feel that the, I've got a wee bit theory, and I talked to you about this afternoon. Um, is that I believe that by elections are there to allow uh, the electorate to protest, and always turns out midterm, wherever it is to be, if you like, bad for the incumbent. But once that protest, once that steam valve has been released, that pressure valve has been released, quite often it can go back the other way to the incumbent, right? Yeah. Um, and if you, if you just look at the by-elections that we saw down in England, yeah, uh, Oxbridge was it? Uh, it was more to do with the ultra-low emission zones coming in and all the rest of it, right? And it should have gone to Labour if that hadn't been there, but it went back to the Tories. So in that one particular one, it wasn't bad for the incumbent. 
they stayed with them. It's only because they had a Labour mayor for London who was bringing in that ultra low emission zone. This one here, this is going to be a standard by election. People are going to go, oh, she was dreadful. She was dreadful for, for getting on that train when she knew she's got it's a protest. Fine, the protest will happen, but I feel that we have enough work with the with the, the activists in the area. It'll yeah. go back the way to to the SNP eventually. It may well do that. I think it would not be good uh, for the SNP though to lose a seat with a five thousand odd majority because it, uh, to the uninitiated it will look like a huge setback. But can I ask you what your thoughts are about uh, the other independence parties standing in that by-election? Do you think they should, or should they step down to let the SNP have a free, a free, free run at it? David, what, David, what do you think? It's democracy. If they want to stand a candidate, let them stand a candidate. Or is this going what, to what do you think? What do you think? Uh, no, it's, it's a democracy. They're a political party. There's a by-election. They're entitled to stand a candidate. Is it good for the movement or uh, in a whole? I'll leave that to others in the room to think of. But what a demo is, it's just going to be another bloody embarrassing situation for that particular political party because they are so young. And history tells us that it takes a very long time for a political party to break into public consciousness. Now, when I speak to my neighbours in my small village and ask them, what do you think about what the, the Alpha Party is going to say? The very first question I get is, who's the Alpha Party? That's a fact. 7,000 members, no representation apart from people who walk the floor, and most people are know that tuned in. So they don't realise that the cat, uh, that they, um, there's two Alpha Party MPs doing that road. And of course, Westminster don't recognise them because they're no SNP. But I mean, this is a democracy. All voices are welcome. If they want to stand a candidate, it might well let Labour. It might well let the um, Labour in, but in a democracy, you can't argue against that. All voices should be welcome in a democracy. And I'm a Democrat to my toes. Okay. What about you, David? What do you think? <clears throat> uh, in actual fact, <clears throat> I would drag this argument further on to the possibility of a, an upcoming plebiscite at the general election. In that situation, what we've got, what we're going to be relying on is, is we're going to be relying on the international community to identify Scotland as being a, an independent nation, right? And what that international community have been looking for all the way through is the SNP. Now, all we need to do is, if, it, if, if the general election becomes a plebiscite, all we have to do is get a, a majority of uh, SNP MPs in place. That's more than 30. It's not about the, the percentage of votes that are taken for that. The Westminster uh, general election doesn't work that way. It's a first past the post. They do not take percentage. Boris Johnson took the, the big majority that he, he got with 41% of the votes. Tony Blair took the landslide with 35% of the votes. Yeah. So therefore, that's that. Uh, Westminster just does not work. It works on bums on seats, right? And uh, we will have to make sure that we get our SNP MPs. It doesn't matter if you support SNP at the moment. If you want independence and you want to give this plebiscite the best chance it has, you vote SNP, hold your nose if you've got to, but vote SNP to get the maximum number of MPs sat on those benches so that uh, Humza Yusuf can therefore go, right, the people of Scotland have spoken. We're independent. Yeah. Now, let's negotiate the CD collection. Yeah, well, I don't know, just, just, just a quick comment on that. Um, the SNP at one time, as Davy has pointed out to us earlier, had a majority of seats and didn't do anything with them. What, what it said was, we have a majority of seats, but we want, we want a referendum. And uh, 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 then subsequently, when, we, when they still had a majority of seats, they still wanted to have a referendum. Uh, so if, if it's the case that as long as there's a majority of seats and that constitutes the will of the people, and I, I think that's a very strong argument, by the way, then why wasn't that argument advanced earlier? 
That's a good question. And it yeah. could well be because of the um, A, because of the uncertainty there's been over the years, especially if we look back at 2012 when the constitutional experts were arguing earlier um, A, who had the power to call a referendum. And then yeah. Alec and, and, and Cameron came to a section 30 order, a section that was deliberately put into the Scotland Act to prevent the Scottish Parliament from properly exercising the will of the Scottish people. And that's important that people have to remember that. But, but when, then again, um, the reason why Nicola and now Humza have moved towards the idea of a plebiscite election is because the Supreme Court shut down the referendum option. But what the Supreme Court did do in, in Section 79 to Section 81 of its rulings was to make it clear that there's power at the ballot box. Basically, what it was referring to the fact that Margaret Thatcher had already in 1985 made it quite clear to the Parliament in Westminster and to the people, this is prior to the evolution, that a, um, if Scotland wanted independence, it only had to send a majority of MPs, pro-independence MPs from that cohort in Scotland. At that time, there were 79 MPs in Scotland. So you and I are old enough to remember that, right? And they, at the time, the SNP had I think it was 11, if I remember correctly, in 1985. I might be wrong, I'm still stuck between 8 and 11. I have to bother looking it up. Right. But, and he, I remember the pish getting ripped to them. And you'll remember this, John, you'd be part of the media at the time. The pish getting ripped to the SMP for asking the question in the first place because there was so little amount of SMP MPs in the place at the time. Um, he, so. But you, you know something, David? A lot of people say you can reduce this to a simple question. I mean, if, if you if you look at the UK government's behaviour in terms of its colonies, right? Now, I know there's an argument, and it's a reasonable argument, that says Scotland's not a colony. But for the purpose of this discussion, let's assume that to all effects and purposes, it is a colony. It's told what to do. It can pass legislation, but that legislation can be overturned on a whim. And that's the case right now. now. Some people would say, well, that's the definition of a colony. But let's leave that technical point aside for a second. Mm. The fact of it is, if you look back through history, you'll see there's a whole range of countries where the UK actually said the following. And I can dig it out. I was looking for it just now. I couldn't find it. Uh, small countries, granted, uh, but on at least two occasions, the, the, the British government said this. We refuse uh, for you to carry out a referendum. And the grounds, listen to this, and the grounds for that refusal is that the people have spoken through a majority in their parliament, and that's all we require. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody in the SNP had looked at it, perhaps I'm, I'm proposing this, and maybe I'm being uh, unfair, but if somebody had looked at these examples from previous years, uh, they may have chosen to uh, identify them or highlight them and say, look, we don't need a referendum. The John, we'll talk about this affair, but actually there's been a good few years pointed this out to the SNP yeah. through the years. Yeah. What you have to do is you've got to look at the timeline, right? The first, uh, the, uh, the first most prominent person that I know of, um, I, then they can shoot me down here, was Angus Brendan McNeil. He actually put up the idea of a plebiscite election at one of the one of the SNP conferences, and he got shouted off the stage. It was not something that people wanted. I ran a, I wrote a, a, a mini blog on it, right, called Plebiscite Freedom, and I got shouted off the stage. Well, uh, you're talking about Facebook here, right? Um, but then, then, when the Supreme Court went, no, you can't eh, have a, a referendum, then that when all of a sudden. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon was the first uh, we, we might be looking at a, a, a plebiscite. So long as, so long as uh, Angus's point is, we have to do something that gets the ballot boxes out of the cupboards. Yeah. Well, the, 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 uh, yeah, if we're not allowed to do it for a referendum, we have to do it for general elections. So if you look back, anybody who's ever opened a history book, uh, which relates to the British Empire, because that we're talking about the fag end of the British Empire, effectively now. Uh, if anyone has ever opened a history book, they know that the British government comes to accommodations or understandings with a whole bunch of different institutions and uh, constitutions and colonies. And, you know, I mean, you know, back in the 
1920s, the Balfour Declaration and all, they said, look, Canada, Australia, and all these other places can become sovereign. Just like that. No vote, nothing. Just you've had your own. But, you know, if, if, if the people at the centre want to do it, it can happen overnight. I think there is a compelling logic, having said all of that, 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 that runs, if we're going to do this, we want to make sure, and I think you referred to it earlier, that the international community, it, 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 it's, not, it's not going to uh, cause them to clutch their pearls and think, oh God, what are these people up to? Uh, and and there's, there are grounds for believing that the international community might not be sanguine over this, because they look at they look at Trident and they look at the North Sea and they look at other things and think, oh, what form would this new state take? And would they immediately, for example, abandon all the contracts in the North Sea? Would, would they immediately say we're leaving NATO? So you can understand why the international community needs and probably deserves some attention when it comes to these things. But, but that's not a game stopper, it seems to me. That's a, a part of a mechanism, almost a technical thing that you say, we've come to a decision and we ask you to respect that decision. Uh, however you come to that decision, it, usually a majority in your parliament is sufficient for you to begin negotiations. These negotiations could take years, who knows? It depends how the other side wants to deal with these matters. But I would have thought that, you know, that, that, that there's pluses and minuses on both sides of that. Hmm. Um, John, we, al we already have the, the, the thing like the Helsinki Accord that's been used before. Um, that's effectively it's a, it's a divorce where the two parties are are totally at loggerheads, and the Helsinki Accord is there to actually allow the the international lawyers to get in and do what they've got to do to go right. Okay, we'll, we'll and they do it a bit at a time. Yeah. That doesn't stop the people of Scotland getting on. We've got plans. That doesn't that doesn't stop us from actually getting on and doing what we've got to do. Right? It's not essentially what the Scottish government is presently doing. It, it's, yeah. it's issued a, a report on the constitution, which seems to me to be this very sort of housekeeping you would want to put before the international community. The very yeah, thing that says, this is the way we're going to behave once we're free. John, there's one other dimension of this that we're not mentioning, it's a bit the elephant, and they really are well supported. We've got uh, bodies like uh, Liberation and Salvo, right? Sarah Sawyers, Mark uh, McNaughton, the Professor Mark McNaughton, um, and what they're doing is they're looking at doing a three-pronged attack where it is, uh, we're, we're going to the UN and get the UN to decolonize us uh, and get the UN to, to uh, organize a referendum under their rules, right, and maybe uh, start an international court case over where the, the, the treaty has, has broken okay. down, right? Now, so, so, we, sorry, we're, we're going to even, yeah, have on the show soon. Uh, yeah, let we'll, me, we'll, me, we'll, me we'll ask you know, to talk about that. that, that. Look, now, all I'm doing is, is giving you our position on that. David and I support uh, Salvo and Liberation and the rest of it in terms of what they are doing. Let them get ahead and do what they're doing. However, if I was 100% died in the wool supporter of Salvo or Liberation, I would also be looking at the plebiscite election and going, right, okay, an international court case can take decades. Uh, getting the UN to move is going to take a long, long time. But there's this thing of the plebiscite where if we just don't get organized and get behind it, then it could get us our independence an awful lot faster. Well, I want to move on. Let me just put one question to you. If, if the independence movement can't get its act together in, tel in terms of Alaba, in terms of the Greens, in terms of the, all the other independence parties and the SAP working together, that's not hugely convincing for the international community or anyone else for that matter. You would say, why don't you guys get your act together and then come back and talk to us? Wouldn't that be a reasonable point? I'll what address you? that one for you, John. The international community are not really interested in what these movements are doing. They're only interested in what the SNP are doing because the SNP have been promoted as the nationalists, if you like, the destructive um, element within the UK. And the international community are looking at whether the people will swing behind the premier policy of the SNP in existence, and that is to bring about independence, 
No, no disrespect to these other groups, including the Alpha Party, which is a brand new party who have done well, 7,000 members. They're not doing nothing in the polls, but 7,000 members, it's a start. Check backwards in 50 years, because that's how long it takes for a party break through. Let's look at the Greens, let's look at the SNP, and a, let's look at history. Yeah, but you say, you say that, but let's look at UKIP. It came from nothing to effectively uh, having its main policy objective uh, uh, agreed and completed. But you're looking at two different nations. UKIP went nowhere here in Scotland. John, hold on a second. In England, UKIP got four million votes and not one MP. But they but they got their objective. Did they? Yes, they did. Was it, not, was it not the Tories that got the got their yeah, objective? Was it not the Tories? Was, yeah, was it not the Tories worried? Was it not the Tories worried? Yeah, 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 the they, 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 what they did was they they effectively uh, uh, required the Tory party to become UKIP, and you could say that's you know, if you, I was addressing Davy's point about a, a party can take a long time to achieve its objective. <laughs> What happened with UKIP? They took almost no time to achieve their objective. <laughs> so therefore, it can be done. But I want to take some questions. So that really, because we've, we've, asked people, we've asked people for questions. Let's take a few questions. Right, let's take a few questions. Yeah. Be fun. What are the two Davies' thoughts on the sea transport offer of catamarans, uh, like the Pentland Firth Ferry from the ex-Scot Stuart Ballantyne, as solutions to the ferry fiasco? Don't know enough about seafaring transport to be able to make a comment on it. To be honest, what about you, David? Um, I I look at the seafaring fiasco, and I look at the uh, Prince of Wales aircraft carrier, which blew up one of its propellers at some time last year, and cost twenty five million pounds to replace. Right, yeah. and then we we'll look at we we'll look at the the the, uh, the, the Caledonian McBrain, these these two ships that they've got coming out, they're still in a timeline to come out, and it's not costing twenty five million. So I don't see what the nonsense is. Well, you've got to look at the timetable that the, the Caledonian McBrain have got. Very very few times they've missed out on on those on not the timetable points. But is that not right as well? Well, ninety-one percent, ninety-one percent AMA is the average worn ferry sailing is being accurate in two times. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. When you when you look at when you take an aircraft carrier out and away to Portsmouth or wherever it is, yeah. right, and it misses one of the major blooming war games in the world, right? That to me is like a an eighty-five percent failure rate. The Caledonian McBrain's doing a very, very well against that. No, that's true. But then again, you could argue on a simplistic basis that two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, and maybe the, the issue is not about the ferries. Maybe the issue is about the way the media conducts itself. I that uh, we seem to have a situation, and I want I like your thoughts on this. And if you agree with it, what you would like to see happen to address it. We seem to have a situation in the UK, in Scotland in particular, where uh, 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 faults attributed to the Scottish government uh, are magnified and faults attributed to the UK government are diminished and it was attenuated. And our media operates on that basis. Uh, for example, if there's a problem in the NHS in England, uh, and to a lesser extent in Wales, then the media goes to the particular NHS and says, you're not doing what you uh, obliged, were obliged to do. In Scotland, they go straight to the First Minister and they say, what are you doing about the NHS? And that one of, that's a symptom of this magnification of the local and the diminution or attenuation of what happens across the UK. 
And it leads to, I suspect, a sense that the Scottish government is underperforming while the UK government is performing reasonably well. That's not because it's based on facts, but it's based on the actual presentation of the data. Um, I'd, like to to on, I'd like to address that one, David, then you keep my own pets. You know, over the years I've been seeing the book we're getting in the press of propaganda. It isn't actually the press holding a truth to power. It is now the press setting the narrative on behalf of power. And it's the reason why you, John, especially as an ex-journalist who's looking on in horror what's happening, are doing the TNT show. It's why I started the Indie Truck, Truck Davey vlog all the years back. It's why Dave and I, for the last 14, 15 months, have been doing the two Davies vlog, because we want to actually point out to people, although we are not the mainstream media and we don't get a chance to hold truth to power, we get to criticise the mainstream media for not holding truth to power, and we get to point that out to our audiences, that the mainstream media are misleading the people. And when you talk about the localism of media, and um, that's the very clever thing that the BBC does, and it reminds me of a poem, and it's called The Weather Where You Are. I'm sure you've heard of it, John. You know, the weather where you are is not the weather where I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, Why don't you tell, tell us the rest of it, David. No, I can't even mind off the top of me. Oh, come on. I'll Let's Google it and put it up. I'll share it. No, no, <laughs> give me this commitment. Uh, dig it out and use it in your show the next next time you're on. Right? Okay, um, we're on a Thursday. I will dig it out because, uh, yeah, um, because I think people will love it. Uh, I think people really need to hear it again, John. I'm sorry I didn't have it on cue just to share. Because you have the same facilities here as what we have in Reese So I could have put it up. Um, but you know the poem I'm talking about. David knows the poem I'm talking about. Most of our audience knows the poem yeah. I'm talking about. But I, that's I want, the main, I want, main I want, media. I want to ask you a comment on the following. Uh, and it's it's to uh, underscore the point you've just been making when we talk about localism and the magnification of the minor and the diminution of the major. And it's this. In Essex, a Tory council, it's been found, gave £655 million to a solar farm uh, tycoon. Uh, he promptly bought a £12 million jet and a £16 million yacht. And the, the, Essex, council, the Essex Tory council is now bankrupt because it owes £1.2 billion. Bearing in mind that the Scottish government is not allowed to run a deficit, <laughs> what, what's your immediate reaction, David Milligan, to that statement? Camp up, man. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. And it always it always comes back to you know, the, the, the big rich guy blooming walking away with the money, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Scotland does not run a deficit. It's not happening. And what's going to happen is, when we become independent, they're all going to go, oh, what about the 15 billion that you lot owe? Right? And we're going to go, what's happened to the gold that was in the Bloomin uh, Bank of England? There's 15 billion there supporting every bank that we've got. So there you are, we're squits on that one. Right, let's start talking about the rest of it. Half. <laughs> Let's have a divorce and start with the word half. I what's interesting about that, David, I don't know if you're aware of this, John, but in the articles in Treaty Union, um, a, all sovereign territories of the, the Crown of the United Kingdom are split 50 50 between England and, and Scotland as long as they're uh, as long as they're offshore. So <laughs> in the Treaty Union, we own half of almost everything that the UK has got offshore. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying, but the, rea the reality is that... Uh, Can I have Panama, please? I'll have Panama. Oh, and, and David wants British Virgin Islands. I'll keep <laughs> yeah, uh, there you go. Well, British Virgin Islands, uh, I, I think the, the last um, accounts for that, British Virgin Islands showed that 16... Billion pounds had gone through that small group of islands, uh, which means that you know it, it's approaching proportionally 
that of the UK government, and not one cent of that has ever been taxed, uh, which is and and the, and these and this is an interesting point, perhaps in light of the constitutional status of Scotland, that these 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 entities, these islands, are, are, are described as dependencies. In other words, they're under the control of the British government, except they're not when it comes to money laundering. So we're back to the this cat again. If you, read, if you read up on it, there's, there's a, a figure that's bandied about via the, the British tax savings, and it's something like £6 trillion pounds floating about on the, these uh, these crown dependencies uh, yeah. that are being used as, as tax havens. I've got a great idea. Look, the, the British Army and all the rest of it are, are like doing that, right? What we do is we get independence, we build up the Scottish Defence Force, and we'll invade all these wee places and we'll just take them over. <laughs> I think that was David Bridges' idea, actually. <laughs> I thought you were. What you, I thought what you were going to say is we can tax these places. <laughs> yeah. Now, no, nothing would put the, the pigeon, uh, the cat among the pigeons, quicker than uh, any uh, perspective or putative Scottish administration or state saying, you know, we want a chunk of the uh, revenues flowing through these dependencies. Uh, well, you will remember, John. There's an awful lot of Scottish trust, a uh, what they call trust funds, run through these dependencies too. Oh yes. You know, Edinburgh is just. A wee bit less corrupt than London, but just a smidgen less corrupt than London. Careful, careful, careful. I'm not. I mean, I, first of all, I'm not. I'm not sure it's a wise thing to to evaluate levels of corruption. I think it, it, it's either corrupt or it ain't. Um, and I think you encourage the worst if you say, "Well, they're they're less corrupt or more corrupt or whatever." I just feel I that you're you're totally if, if they could possibly achieve it. Uh, see, if somebody's here saying that. I think the SNP is going to split uh, and uh, and it be replaced by something. Who knows what it might be replaced by? Uh, don't know about that. And I don't think it's. I don't think it's. Uh, it's really relevant because we're actually going in that direction. You know. Um, um, probably after. No, I think it's a fair point because probably after independence, the after SNP is a broad yeah. church. Yeah. It's a broad church. It's got the left, the right, the centre. It's why it's made great policies in the last fifteen years. Because they've had to compromise with each other, and it's been good for the people of Scotland. The mitigation of the um, a bedroom tax, the freeze in the council tax, the baby vote. That's all consensus week. Right, left, right, and centre, and the yeah. SNP to come up with decent policy. But to say that the SNP might split, yep, a fair statement, but I don't see it until maybe a decade after independence, because we're going to need that major political party to be able to drive things forward. If anybody thinks they can do uh, the independence thing without the SNP, no, guys, you need the SNP to get the ballot boxes out. Yeah, uh, there's a whole uh, bunch of people that agree with you. Uh, somebody say, why can't we just invade the tax havens? <laughs> because that's not where the money is. Just a, a quick a quick response to Patricia. Thanks, Patricia, for your question. Yeah. I'm not I'm not laughing at your question. I'm simply saying, for all practical purposes, there's no money in the tax havens. The money is actually kept in London. It just happens to have a label that says tax haven. If you want, <laughs> if you want the money, uh, I'm sure there's somebody in London who could deliver it um, without going without having to invade anywhere. Um, yeah, so, talk, talk, about, talk about invasions. We've got we, uh, just a, a, a wee anecdote for you. Uh, David and I are, we're, we're friends with a chap called Jacobite McLaughlin, right? Jacobite was always on the, the League of Very Sovereign Scots was was the group on Facebook that we set up, and Jacobite was on all the time, right? The poor guy ended up he got cancer, right? He lived in New York and he, he had a house in, in Edinburgh, didn't he, David? Right? Yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah. and. Uh, uh, and what happened was he, he got really, really miffed, uh, miffed off one night. Uh, the the thing that was coming out of Number 10 down the street, whatever it was at the time, okay? And he drank a full bottle of whiskey. And then he took to his keyboard. And he was, he was trying to get us to form a, an army to march on Downing Street. <laughs> so at the time, it was the run-up to the 2014 referendum. We had every single reporter for the Mail, the Mirror, the Sun, 
Daily Record and others, watching our groups to see what we were saying, right? See the next morning. I'd won umpteen phone calls off reporters wanting the story on, on March on, uh, on Downing Street. That was mental. <laughs> in the and the League of Sovereign Scots is a, a renegade group. Yeah. Yeah. Right, they get Peter Bell to pen a, pen, yeah. pen a correction and it would be banjack about for a couple of days just to let things well, cool down. <laughs> So, so every time that David and I are talking privately and things are really bad coming from down the street, we go, Jack about we should have listened to you soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know something, earlier, well, bless his cotton socks, earlier we talked about, uh, we were talking about the media and, uh, I mean, obviously I, I, I call them for the national. Uh, and, uh, by the way, we, we, we are completely non-discriminatory on the TNT show. Uh, we, have, we have people who are unionists on, or at least uh, have tried to convince us that they're in favour of federalism and stuff like this. Uh, though I, I suspect deep in their, in their boots, they're uh, rather committed unionists. But, but we're happy to have them on board. Uh, can I ask you a question about, I, I, I'm not frightened of criticism. So even though we invite the BBC almost every single week on my column, I invite the BBC to come on the TNT show, not a murmur. So all these people who can call you and say, what do you think of this, these scores of reporters, not one of them will come on the TNT show to defend the approach of uh, journalist, journalism. I have an interesting story. One or two that exceptions, story. Kenny Parkinson's been on uh, and, and one or two others, but very, very few. And nobody from the BBC. Which I have an uh, interesting story about the BBC, John. We held the, David, myself and the boy for the Highlands and we held a protest outside the BBC. It wasn't a great way to attend it, but 175 years. Um, a Ruth Watts, an ex-BBC um, Asia um, director, things like that, were a, um, or Asia, a, a political reporter or whatever, gave a speech outside talking about the diminishing um, a standards at the BBC and things like that. We all gave speeches. Anyway, the BBC sent a reporter out to speak to us and invite us in. And Dave and I said, no thanks, why don't you come out? We've got your cameras, you've got your cameras, we're going to run on this debate. Because if we get in there, we're not prepared, we're going to get mugged by these professional journalists. Right? Do you know that the, when in their website the next day, it said that David McGuinness refused to speak to us. The guy spent half an hour, I bought him a cup of coffee, and we had a half an hour chat. And to be fair to the guy, I think his name was Billy, he said to me at the time, he says, you know when I get in here, they're going to butcher this, aren't they? He says, they're going to say that you didn't want to speak to us. And I just spent half an hour having a cup of coffee with me and explaining what the problem was for, for us. Well, you know, you know, you know something. You know something. I think you, I think you rather undersold yourself there. I think you should have gone in there and you should have uh, put your big boy's boots on and done the interview. Because you know something. The two of you tonight, the two of you tonight, right, <clears throat> have not only provided good entertainment, but you've been interested and to the degree that you can be. Objective, you've been comprehensive, and uh, you haven't taken any snatch. And I think if you'd done that with that BBC, I think you would have gone over exceptionally well. No, I think we can all say that when we hear that protest on it, we would have more. We would have been murdered on the cutting room floor. On the cutting room floor, yeah, you're absolutely right. But so the way to avoid that is for you, if it's for you to take your camera and uh, as you plan to do and say, and, We're happy and they, can, and they could put their story out. To a wider audience than I could at that time. Oh, no. I, to, be fair, to be fair, David, it's a few years on where we were more media wise. I think yeah. John right, we could have probably took them on. Our yeah. biggest problem would have been the cotton room floor. I get back to Bristol. At, I get back to Bristol at midnight on, on Friday. Let's be at the blooming BBC's front door at 9 a.m. the next morning. Eh? That's how much I'm up for it. <laughs> I, I think that, I think the BBC is going to change uh, as and when the political parties change. I mean, if you can behave however you like, and the political parties are happy to accommodate your behaviour, then you're going to do whatever you prefer to do. I mean, right? Now, nobody in the BBC in Scotland reports to anybody in Scotland. They report to somebody in London, and that's the way it's set up. So it's a no-brainer. I mean. Even if they were the worst broadcaster in the world, they could continue. 
because the, uh, the, the, the way I look at the way I, uh, uh, John, the way I look at Pacific Key is this: it's a resource. We would be silly to actually be idiots and go in and blame and set it in fire and all that after after independence, yeah. right? Yeah? yeah, it's a resource that we can use. The first thing we yeah. should do is after we get independence, is ask the people politely, well, get up, leave, right? Okay, call you, call Kevin, get everybody in that's that's prepared to actually produce from that building a Scottish uh, proper Scottish news program. Yeah. Let me just, let me put a suggestion to you just before you reply, to me. It seems to me this can be fixed by a very simple expedient. That is, the, 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 their customers, they should be responsible to their customers, not to somebody else. So if their customers are telling them as they are, and, uh, and poll after poll and study after study, you're failing us, then that should be the determining factor. Not a political party, not anyone else. So, in other words, there ought to be a governing uh, element well, in, in, that they report to in Scotland. Now, they I have agree with you 100%, John. I, don't I agree think that's 100%. Good. And the reason why I agree with you 100% is because the customers here in Scotland are voting with their feet. Yeah. We have got the highest level of non compliance of TV license paying, paying and the lowest level of convictions for it. Because People in Scotland have looked at the content over the last, especially since 2014, and went, nah. This isn't a true reflection of what's happening in Scotland. Like, for example, recently, we uh, carry on at the tail end of the pandemic there, especially during the winter, when hospitals were allegedly overwhelmed. <laughs> I went and did research on it, and I went and had a look, and the BBC had actually amplified the problem by three or four times. They weren't reflective of what was going on here in Scotland. They were reflective of what was going on in certain areas of England. And I know that for a fact, and David and my audience can tell you, because I had nurses, I had doctors, I had ambulance drivers, everybody sending me information under the radar, because obviously it's their jobs that are on the line, but I was able to broadcast that daily yeah. and tell people what the actual circumstances were. I, I, I mean, the thing that made people didn't they think about Dane, especially BBC Scotland, was I walked into the accident and emergency services in Scotland and had a look. And I took my camera with me. Yeah. Um, the, the, the other thing is, which is a very germane point uh, with, with, with John, is the fact that we've discussed this before, John. We reckon that if everybody in Scotland stopped paying their TV licence. The British government would keep BBC Scotland going because it is a route to push out propaganda. And also, when you look at, say, things like the Telegraph newspaper, which is in trouble financially, it's being kept going. How is it managed to be kept going? Because it's the old-fashioned Tory graph. That's where people are, uh, are, are saying, well, that's our newspaper. That needs to be kept going. Simple as that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, there is value to people who want to push propaganda to keeping a broadcast system going. Well, that was the point about the lack of, uh, the lack of uh, connection to the audience. And, and if it were a business, it would be out of business just now. Uh, because if you have a situation where your customers don't buy your product, you, you don't exist for very long. BBC is in a unique position. By it can have almost no purchases of its product, but it can continue. And that's an anomaly. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that will continue for very much long. Uh, the BBC in London is sharpening its pencil, and they're closing off whole chunks of the BBC because they're not paying their way. And there'll come a time when eventually they'll say to the folks in Pacific Key, I'm sorry, we've protected you long enough. Now it's your turn. And that will be anything done by anybody in Scotland. It won't be a reflection of customer reaction. It'll simply <clears> be an economic decision taken by somebody elsewhere. Uh, you know, I remember, I remember, sorry, John, I, I remember prior to 2014, one of the big arguments was, that people were worried about. Oh, what about my what about my uh, my BBC East Enders and all the rest of it that we still want to watch, right? And what we did was we actually we found out what Northern uh, what, what Ireland 
pays the BBC to get yeah. its complete package. And it was something like, uh, was it £250,000 a year? And that served the entire country. Those, those people could watch the whole full gamut of BBC programmes. Yeah. yeah? So... Well, in, you know in, something... It's been a great and interesting discussion. I'm, I'm not, it's not simply my words. I'm simply repeating what's on the the, the chat facility, the comments facility. That's what people are saying. So uh, thank you both. Uh, we've run out of time. Our 60 minutes, our allotted 60 minutes are gone, and it's gone almost like in a, in a, in a flash. Thank you both, David and Davey. Bye. It's been entertaining. Bye. It's been educational. And, and hopefully we can do it again sometime. I hope we can continue this conversation. I'm more than happy. Good everyone, and thanks for watching, everybody, and thanks for your questions. I'm just going to say a few concluding remarks.